you guys bow your heads with me for a uh, opening prayer, please? Father, we, we come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord. We ask, Lord, we invite you, Lord, in this place. We ask that, uh, that you be here, that you instruct us, that you lead us, that you guide us, that you correct us, Lord. We ask that you would remove distractions from our mind, any worry, any stress, whatever it may be, that you take it away during this time so we can get the most from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. One quick announcement. Uh, my wife just texted me. Uh, as far as the um, the uh, the women's cookie exchange thing, um, if you've got daughters that want to come, go ahead and, and have them come as well. Even even if they aren't eighteen, just have them come uh, also. <coughs> We are in John chapter 2 today. John chapter 2, a very familiar message, familiar among believers and unbelievers. We're looking at the story um, and then the wedding of Cana, where Jesus turns water into wine. Normally, unbelievers will go to this passage for a total different reason than why believers uh, go to it. But today, we're looking at this passage, and we're looking at the first uh, 11 verses, and um, there is a lot here for us as servants. There is a lot here in regards to having a, a purposeful, fulfilling life in Jesus Christ. So look out for those things, because what we're talking about today is fulfillment. We're talking about service to the Lord. We're talking also about the new covenant as well. There's several things that um, I definitely want to touch on uh, this morning. John chapter 2. Now, just to give you some background here, because we have been going over uh, different passages in the Old Testament and whatnot. We went over Ruth, we went to um, 1 Samuel, we went to Psalms, and now we're back in the New Testament uh, during this uh, intermediate series before we begin the, the Gospel of Mark. Just to give you some background here, John wrote this Gospel to shed light on the deity of Jesus Christ, to shed light on the, the signs of Jesus that pointed back to to who he was, to the fact that he was the Son of God, to the fact that he was God himself. So John chapter 1, the chapter that comes before chapter 2, is very theological. Even the first verse, the first verse says that in the, in, in the beginning uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, or more literal, God was the Word. And then he, he goes on to tell us in verse 14 that the Word <clears throat> became flesh, the Word incarnate, Jesus Christ. God became man. And during this time, when Jesus is sort of being introduced here, and Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist, and then he goes into the wilderness, and, and he's tested for 40 days, and so on. After this happens, Jesus begins his three-year ministry. Jesus begins um, gathering his 12 disciples. At this time, it's believed that there was about maybe five or six. Half of his, his disciples were gathered already, uh, Nathaniel being the last one. Right before he gets to the wedding here in Cana, he's got about five or six disciples, and they are there with him. I'm just trying to give you the, uh, the background here uh, quickly. And this is what we're looking at. Jesus Christ is probably 30, 31 or so, and he's, he's embarking on the ministry that the Father has given him. He, he's about to start doing uh, <clears throat> what was planned beforehand for him to do. We don't know too much about Jesus' childhood. We don't know too much about the intermediate years, as some call them. Uh, but we do know what happened here. And all these things that we read about really point to the glory of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the things I want you guys to be looking out for, the glory of Jesus, because that's what um, John wants to highlight here. For example, Mark, the Gospel of Mark highlights the, um, uh, the servanthood of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus didn't come to be served, that he came uh, to serve. But he, he John being, uh, John the revelator here, he, he comes to highlight the deity of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, and his death, and so on. So let's begin here with that in mind. John chapter 2, verse 1 says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So there's four things I want you to observe um, in these uh, verses here. Number one, this stuff happened on the third day. Number two, this was in Cana of Galilee. This is in northern Israel. Number three, Mary was already there, it seems. 
And number four, Jesus was invited to this wedding. Jesus and five or six disciples that were with him uh, presently at the time. So why is it significant? Why does John point out to us that this happened on the third day? Now normally, what do we think about when we read in the Bible the third day? Resurrection, right? And I think, you know, John being John, because he does talk a lot about the resurrection, he does want to highlight that aspect of Jesus Christ in his ministry, I think he does sort of um, allude to that here. At least in verse 19, uh, Jesus refers to the third day when he would resurrect again. If you want to turn in your Bibles to verse 19, James chapter, this is at, when Jesus uh, leaves the wedding at Cana and he goes to, the, to cleanse the temple. Jesus tells the religious leaders, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So I believe there is a close connection to the resurrection, no doubt, and I think that's why John mentions it. But another interesting observation, some of you might know this already, is that the third day among the Jews, the Jewish week and so on, even our, our week, is Tuesday. Why was the third day significant as far as weddings go? Well, it, it was customary, it was something very traditional for the Jews to get married on Tuesday. They could get married on Monday or Sunday, but Tuesday was uh, the traditional day to get married. And they went back to Genesis chapter 1. I think you, you can see it in verse 9 and 12. Um, they saw the third day as a double blessing. Because in Genesis, the third day is the day that God says it was good twice. So Jewish you know, groom and, and the, the Jewish groom and the Jewish uh, uh, bride, they, they would choose that day. That, that's the day of double blessing. I'm going to get married on that day. And that could be significant. It could very well be Tuesday, a day of double blessing. And, and I say that only because it was going to be a blessing that they invited Jesus Christ because he was going to sort of save the wedding. He was going to save the day. Notice Jesus is not uh, crashing the wedding. He's, he, he, he didn't come uninvited. He was invited and he was there. And, you know, he's, he's not a hermit, right? Jesus is not, wasn't isolated and secluded from society. No, he, he went where he was invited. And he's there. And his mom is there as well. And his desi disciples are there as well. Now, I don't know if, if Mary was related to the, to the bride and groom. She could have been related. I mean, again, it's a, it's a small area. A lot of people, everybody knew everybody. Oh, or she could have been working. She could have been working or involved somehow in this wedding, or maybe even both. You know, sometimes when we, uh, when we have weddings and different events, we will have uh, the aunt, right, or, or somebody in charge of something and so on. So, my opinion is that Mary somehow was connected to the wedding and groom, maybe even uh, related, because she had some interesting information as far as, far as the wine being, being gone. So what happens here? Well, John gets straight to the point. He gives us the problem right away after verse 2. It says, And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him these four words, They have no wine. They have no wine. Later on, we're going to see that the headmaster seems kind of unaware of the fact that the wine was gone. Or, you know, he seems to me like he wasn't fully aware. I think Mary had some. You know, Mary is connected to the servants here. Either way, Mary does what Mary does. She tells her son, Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus is there. She, she, she tells him, but because she sees, well, you know, I know what Jesus can do. She knows, you know, the, she knows the the, the, birth, the birth of Christ was unique. Jesus was no ordinary person. So she brings a problem to Jesus Christ. I think anybody would do that in, in, if we were in her place as well. She says to her son, they have no wine. Why was that a big deal? Why can't they just, they just you know, go get some wine across the street somewhere? It was a big deal because the weddings back then were not like the weddings today, where you, know, you got a reception, and then you got maybe a 15, 15 20 minute uh, wedding ceremony. It, it, it's usually over in two to four hours and so on. Back then, the weddings lasted about seven or eight days. It was a long thing. So you needed a lot of food. You needed a, a lot of drinks. You needed a lot of stuff. They probably uh, over-invited and under-prepared. Whatever the reason, they ran out of wine. And back then, if you ran out of wine, it was a big thing. It was like... Uh, they wouldn't let you live it down. Some people even got sued for not having wine. Family members would sue each other. I'm serious. They, they would sue each other because they, it was a big thing. The, the, the wine, see, the wine in the Bible is symbolic of joy, of newness of life. And when they, they, when they ran out of the wine, they would end up have, having to, to drink uh, dirty, dirty water. 
A lot of times what they would do is they, they would mix water with wine that we're drinking, like, you know, diluted uh, wine and so on for, for the, you know, uh, flavor and whatnot. So don't think when you, when you read about wine that they're, they're, they're getting tipsy and they're all drunk. Don't, don't, uh, don't assume that in the text here. But it was a big thing if they ran out of wine. Nobody wanted to be drinking dirty water in, in a big celebration, a wedding. So it was a big offense. So, so Mary's like, you know, Jesus is here. I'm just going to let him know, and, and he's going to save the day. What does Jesus say in verse 4? He says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, right off the bat, just reading this, I think just understanding, you know, he, he, uh, grade level English, is like Jesus is being rude to his mom. But he's not being rude to his mother. I think half of you know this already, but I'll, I'll share it for the other half. Uh, when Jesus says woman, he's not referring, degrading his mother by any means. He's just referring, to, it's like saying lady or, or madam. But nonetheless, he's still addressing something. He's still trying to teach his mom something here. And, and we need to, he, here's where we get our first lesson. Because Jesus is in, you know, he's not trying to be mean when he says, you know, in other words, that's not my problem, right? What, he says, woman, what does your concern have to do uh, with me? He's trying to teach us a lesson. See, Jesus had already started his ministry. He's got three days going, right? He's got three days, he's three days strong here. And, and now, if you're familiar with the Gospels, Jesus was on the Father's timetable, not on his mother's timetable. Jesus wasn't so much a, a mama's boy as he was a, a, a daddy's boy here in, in a real sense, right? He was doing the will of the Father. So whatever he did from that point on, right, not that he stopped taking care of his mom, his responsibilities towards his mother, honor your parents, but, but now he was focused, his main concern, his main focus was to serve God and to do things in, in God's timing, not so much in anybody else's timing. Some believe that Mary was trying to vindicate herself here as well by using Jesus to, to fix the problem because there was the accusation, the assumption, people talking, possibly talking behind her back, that, you know, she cheated on Joseph. That they, they, you know, we'll be talking about that in December uh, during Christmas. But um, there was that assumption. There was that definite gossip for sure that, hey, you know, Mary, Mary cheated on Joseph and she fabricated the story about the virgin birth and whatnot. But this, in Mary's eyes, this could have very well been a time uh, where she saw it as, this is my time to redeem myself. They're going to see that Jesus is no ordinary man. That actually I did not cheat on Joseph. That it was an actual God thing that happened uh, there. But Jesus wasn't about to, to do things, to do miracles and signs, necessarily to vindicate his mother or to, or to save the wedding, right? Or to save the um, social embarrassment for this couple. No, Jesus was going to do things according to God's uh, uh, timeline, right? He was going to do this according to God's timeline. And it's not wrong, guys, it's not wrong to save the day. It's not wrong to, to save somebody from public embarrassment. You know, I think we should. When you get the opportunity to do that, uh, you, should, you should do good, right? We should all do good. But Jesus has a higher lesson for us uh, to learn. And here it is. Mary was concerned with human needs alone. Jesus was concerned with his Father's will. You and I as Christians, yeah, we should do good, but we should do good for a higher purpose. We should do good to give God the glory, not necessarily to vindicate ourselves or to necessarily save the day and get the glory, right? No, we, we do things because we love God and then we love others. First, we need to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then from that love, we are going to represent God right when we love others. Because see, this is what happens a lot, even among, among ministers and pastors. They, they end up doing things for the sake of people. They do good for the sake of people, and it becomes very horizontal. And, and, and they avoid, offend, they're more concerned with of, not offending, not getting stoned, rather than, than representing God the right way, properly, right? So Jesus is like, I, I, look, Jesus is not saying no. He's saying, wait, and I'm going to do it on my father's time. Because he, he said, what does he tell his mother? My hour has not yet come. What hour is he talking about? Well, Jesus here is pointing to his death and a resurrection. Jesus came to die. He came in a womb to end up in a tomb and to resurrect back from the dead. That was his, that was his hour, right? So Jesus is trying to teach Mary a, a lesson here. Every time Jesus asks his disciples a question or other people a question, it's because he's trying to teach them a lesson. It's not because he doesn't know the answer, by the way. He knows all things. But, but he's always trying to teach a lesson. So here's our first point if you're taking notes. Our service to others must first 
arise from our service to God. Our service to others must first arise from our service to God. Whatever God has called you to do, if you're aware of your calling, your ministry, uh, your gift and whatnot, you need to work in, in line with that, in line with God's will. Never be pressured to do something because there's simply a need. Yeah, there's a need. Pray about it. If the Lord is calling you to fulfill that need, you need to meet the need, right? Maybe that's why God placed you where you, wherever it is that you're at. But we've got to understand, if God has called me to do something else, I can't prioritize this over here just to save the day or to make somebody feel better. Jesus was on the Father's uh, timeline. We do serve, we do do good, but our service to others must first arise from our service to God. The lesson here is, look, yeah, I'm going to save the day, but not to save these people from embarrassment, but to save people from their sins. Because he's pointing to the, to the death of the Lamb. He's pointing to, to the hour that he would die and the hour that he would res, resurrect back uh, from the dead. So here's a few questions for us. Number one, how will God be glorified through this? Whenever it is that you do good for someone else, how is God, ask yourself, how is God being glorified through this? Am I pointing to Jesus or am I pointing back uh, to myself? And those are good questions. Those are good uh, inspection questions, if you will, that will keep us in line when we do good for others. Because see here, Jesus is not necessarily saying no. He's saying, wait, I'm going to do it, you know, in God's timing. And he does, right? He, he ends up turning water into wine. We know the end of the story here. I think it, it could have been sort of a moment, you know, when, when you're about to do something, you're aware of, of a situation, you haven't told anybody else, but you're about to fix a problem, you're about to do something, and then somebody comes over to you and says, hey, there's a problem here, this and there, you should do this, and you're like, I, I was already going to do that. I, I'm, I'm, I was aware of the situation already, and I was already going to do that. Jesus, I believe, was already aware of the situation. I believe he's already going to do that. But what, what we need to know is how are we going to glorify God to this. And I keep saying glorify God and so on because that's what it's about. Look at verse 11. It says, this beginning of signs, uh, this beginning of signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. That was, a, that was the intention here. When Jesus was on earth, he didn't heal everybody, right? He didn't, there were some people that didn't get healed by Jesus Christ. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the objective, the goal was to glorify the Father, to bring glory to his name. And that's something we need to keep in mind uh, when we pray to Jesus Christ as well, that we don't rush him, that we wait on the Lord, that we don't say, Lord, you need to do this. Because isn't it true, a lot of times when we come to God in prayer, when we ask God for something, there's a problem, we bring it to his attention, that's all good, right? Do that. When there's a problem, bring it to Jesus. But we need to wait on the Lord as well and wait for his will. That's what the Bible tells us, doesn't it? Matthew chapter 6. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, not my will. And when we wait on God, we need to wait on God. Somebody put it like this, like a, like a waiter waits on us. Like a waiter waits on us at, at a restaurant, right? The waiter will come, uh, you know, is there anything you need? What can I get you? And then the waiter will take off. But a good will, waiter will keep coming back and forth to see what you need, not ignore you, not neglect you. And as Christians, we've got to keep coming back to the Lord in that manner to see the, if God has an answer for us and to continue serving uh, the Lord. Look at what Jesus says later on, about four chapters later in John 6, 38. He says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus was not here to do his own will or his mother's will, but to do his father's will. Again, service to others must arise from our service to God. So, and this is why I say that Jesus wasn't saying no, because if we look at Mary's words, immediately after Jesus tells her, woman, what is this to do with me? What, what, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Immediately after, what does Mary say? Who does Mary turn her attention to? The servants, right? And she says, whatever he says to you, do it. See, Mary, Mary knew Jesus. She lived with him for 30 years or so, right? She knew what this meant. She didn't know that Jesus was going to act, but he was going to do it according to the Father's timeline. He's going to do it according to the Father's uh, will. And what better advice is there than this? What better advice is there than this when it comes to, to Jesus Christ? Just do what the Word of God says. Just do what Jesus says, in other words, right? Mary is pointing to her son, not to herself. 
Never do we see anything in the scriptures and necessarily elevate Mary to some uh, stature. But some do that, don't they? Let's, listen, let's take Mary's words here and listen to what Mary says. She says, whatever he says, that is Jesus, whatever he says to you, do it. So she turns to the servants, right? And she tells them, just do what he tells you. She knows he's about to work. She knows it's about, not so much about uh, doing her a favor. It's not necessarily a family blood thing. It's about serving God. At, another, at a later time, when Jesus was uh, uh, in the middle of ministry and there's a crowded, you know, he's, he's, in the monks, he's amongst uh, a lot of people, his mom, his brother, and sisters are outside wanting to talk to him, wanting to see him. And some guy says, hey, your mom and brothers are outside. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 12, how, how he responds to this. He says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples, and that's everyone here as well. Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So you get the idea here? Jesus puts the emphasis on doing his will, on doing God's will, on serving the Lord. And that's why he focuses on the servants here, or he's about to focus on the servants here as well. We've got to be conscious of our calling and God's will in our life. Look at verse 6 now. Check out what Jesus does here. Now, everything John says is important. God doesn't waste words in the Bible. Everything is very important. Verse 6 says, Now there were set there, one translation says nearby, they were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So you have these, these stone water pots, and there were six of them. Six is the number of man, and we'll, that's significant or something we're going to talk about later. But I'll mention it now in case I forget later. And these, these stone water pots were, were there for cleansing purposes. So the Jews would cleanse themselves with, these, with the water in the pots, and they would do this before a meal and in between a meal. And they would also do it for you know, ritualistic purposes as well and whatnot. So there was about six of them, and each of them had about 20 to 30 gallons apiece. So there was, this was a big, big wedding, a big party, right? And, and these stones, these water pots, they, they were sort of common. It's like seeing a water fountain. We don't stop and admire it. You know, it, it was that common. People would pass them by and so on. And, and guess what? The water would assume the water would be dirty, right? This water would uh, definitely uh, have a lot of germs, and it'd be dirty. So let's finish reading here, verse 7 to 11. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So this was later on in the week, in the wedding. They would be pretty empty. And they filled them up to the brim. Notice that. Full, overflowing. Our message is titled Brimming. It's overflowing. It's full. And notice Jesus says, And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. <laughs> when the master of the feast had tasted the water that it was made wine, the miracle happened somewhere in between uh, drawing the water out and on the way to uh, the headmaster here, the, the banquet master. Notice. It was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the, notice the parentheses here, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, notice, he, he doesn't go to Jesus, he goes to the bridegroom. He thinks the bridegroom is the one uh, behind this uh, awesome uh, wine. He says, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. I was wondering about this. I was like, how, how did the groom respond? Did he take credit for it, or did he, you know, say, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but it's a good question, I think. Verse 11, the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples um, believed him. So the headmaster, I don't know if he was fully aware that they were running out of wine or not, or that they had completely run out. But we know, John tells us, that the servants knew what happened. They were aware of the miracle, and they were involved in this miracle. And the disciples who were sitting around Jesus, they knew what happened as well, right? It says that they believed in him. Uh, Jesus gets the glory uh, for this. So there's four things I want you to take note of here. There's four interesting observations that will help you appreciate the next point. Number one, Jesus is giving instructions. One person is giving instructions, and number two, the servants are obeying Jesus. 
Jesus gives instructions. Number one, number two, the servants are obeying Jesus. Number three, a miracle happens before their eyes. Instruction, service, miracle. Number four, and there was joy and fulfillment at the end. Remember? Wine is symbolic of joy. It, it would have, see, Jesus, the, the backstory here, or the, in a nutshell, what Jesus does here, Jesus saves the day. What would have been a terrible time of disappointment, Jesus turns it into a time of joy and celebration because of what Jesus has done, right? Because of the miracle, the sign he has done. And I say sign because a sign uh, is better uh, rendered here. Instead of just miracle, a sign points to something, right? So this sign pointed to who Jesus Christ uh, was. So we see four things. I hope you uh, took note of them. Now, Jesus doesn't just dictate. He does say, he, he does teach the truth and so on, but I want you to understand that it's not that Jesus wasn't getting involved. It's that Jesus wanted others to get involved as well. Jesus, you know, he could have just turned it and turned the water into wine like that. He could, I mean, he, he healed people from long uh, uh, distance range. He healed people all the time. He, he didn't have to be there next to them to heal them. But, but the point was, the, the bigger lesson here is that he wanted to, to use people to, to bring about something great. He wanted the servants to see that. He wanted his disciples to see that as well. And I think they, he ha they, they filled it to the brim to see that, hey, this is water. You can't add anything to it. Anything you add to it is, is really not going to affect it. It's, gonna, it's just going to sort of spill over. So here's the point. Jesus is going to do stuff. He's going he's gonna to do great things. And Jesus did not stop moving at this time. He didn't stop moving during the, uh, the Jesus movement. He's still moving. Are, are we moving with him is the question. Are we moving with Jesus Christ? Are we better set? Are we following instructions still? Because see, these servants, these unnamed servants, these are us. We are Jesus' servants. Jesus is still teaching. Jesus is still giving instructions. See, God's going to get involved, but we need to get involved as well. It, it, prayer is never um, a substitute for obedience. Yes, we pray. Yes, we see God's will. But then, then comes a time that I need to get up, and I need to do what God, God's word uh, Yes. See, here's our point. If you want your life to be fulfilling, you must put in the work to fulfill it. If you want your life to be fulfilling, if you want your life, if you will, brimming, overflowing, you need to put the work for that to happen. Let me give you a normal example. I mean, if you want your, if your marriage is in the rocks, if, if, you, if that passion is no longer there, like the... the you know the butterflies you used to get when you, get, when you were dating, when you met each other and so on? If it's not there, maybe you've been married 5, 10, 15, 20 years or more. It's not long, no longer there. Your job and my job is to continue to go back to the, those first works, to continue to date each other, right? To, to date each other, to, to spend time, time together and so on, to put in the work. If, if, if you don't put any money in the bank, how are you going to take anything out, right? It, it, with the Lord, it's the same as well. And look at it as a privilege. We get to see God work through us. We get to be his servants. Servanthood uh, has purpose. Servanthood brings true fulfillment. It's never going to be idleness, guys. You and I, we're, we're going to feel empty. We're gonna, when we are idle, when I, stop, when I start slacking off, when I become a procrast uh, procrastinator and, and I start being sluggish and lazy, I feel empty. I get depressed. Some of us, when we get depressed, we just eat food, right, to feel better. And, and, and eating food, putting food in our bodies and, and doing you know, being on Facebook or binging on this and that, that's, that, that's short-lived. That's like the, what the world offers first and then comes the worst. But, but the Lord has the best for us in, in service when we empty ourselves and when we serve uh, Him. So, so God's going to do the miracle, but you need to do uh, the work. Because fulfillment, fulfillment in, our, in our life does not happen apart from serving the Lord. Somebody put that, said this, he stated, this, stated it this way, he said, People may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find once they reach the top that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. The ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. And often that's us. That's us when we choose to follow our own pipe dreams or what we think is going to make, what we think is a new wine, what we think is where the life is at. When we do that apart from the Lord, then you're going to find yourself in disappointment, in, in, in shame even, because you weren't doing God's will. But if you do God's will, if you obey his words like these servants, these unnamed uh, servants, you're going to find fulfillment. And God, God will bless you when you serve him always. You know, at, at a later time in the Gospel of John, 
when Jesus feeds the 5,000, it was over 5,000, by the way, but when he feeds them, when he multiplies the bread and, and the water, there was 12 baskets fulls left over, right? And you got 12 disciples, so I'm pretty sure they kept, each one kept the basket. And it's, it, again, it speaks about overflowing. Jesus doesn't just have, Jesus does Jesus does not just want you to have a life. He wants you to have a full life. Isn't that, the, isn't that what the Bible says? He doesn't just want you to go to heaven. He wants you to, you know, have a full life here on earth as well. He doesn't want you grumpy and muggy and being a, her, a religious hermit. He wants you to have life. John 10.10 10 says it best. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I might add, have it to the brim, overflowing. That's the kind of life Jesus wants for you and he wants for me. But in order to see that life, we need to see these water pots as, as our, our life with Jesus Christ. We're either going to fill it or we're not. And filling it took work, didn't it? It wasn't like bringing out the garden hose and putting the garden hose in there and waiting for it to fill up. No, it took work. They had to take pictures one at a time to fill it. It took time. It took deliberateness and persistence. If you're not persistent, if you're not deliberate in your service to Jesus Christ, don't expect to find fulfillment. I can't expect to find fulfillment in my idleness. And maybe some of you are here to listen to a, a feel-good message. You know, I'm just here to, to, to receive and, and feel good. And No, a lot of times it's not us judging the preacher. A lot of times it's, it's God's Word judging us. I'm here to, for God to judge me and to tell me what to do. I need to leave my, my entitlements at the door. We need to leave our entitlements at the door because we, we are the servants here. We're here to serve. We're not here necessarily to give direction, but to take direction from Jesus Christ. And, and when you do that, guys, when we... When we think that way, then we're going to see the blessing. Then we're going to see the blessing in our life. And, and, and it's not going to be these water pots that are going to be overflowing, but it's going to be, it's going to be my life. It, it's going to be your life. Why? Because Jesus wants our life to be full. He wants our life to be, to be brimming to the surface. What else do we see here? Well, there's an interesting observation that I had never seen before, but it caught my eye this time. I want you to look at verse 6 again. It says, now there were set there six water pots of stone. I like how the New Living uh, renders it. The New Living says, standing nearby were six stone water jars. That to me is significant. Because a lot of the times, maybe some of you guys can relate, a lot of times we think, well, in order for me to really serve Jesus significantly, that is, that is, I mean, yeah, I can pass out bulletins. Yeah, I can take a day in children's ministry for a month. Yeah, I'll clean the church, but in order for me to really, you know, serve Jesus, then, then I got to go to seminary, or I got to go somewhere else far away, maybe in the mission field for a week or whatever, and, and then I'm really serving Jesus. But the reality is that Jesus wants to use you where you're at. It's not somewhere far away, it's nearby. And that's why I'm addressed, that's why this, this fact is very significant uh, to me. These stone uh, water pots were not far away, they were, they were nearby. You see, usefulness for Jesus is not far away. It's nearby. All you got to do is, is see where you're at. Where am I at? It, it's, a lot of times it's in the little things, the insignificant things, these dirty water pots. They were insignificant, really. I mean, they, they used them to wash your hands and so on. I hope everybody used them. But, but the point really is they were just like looking at a water fountain today. And a lot of times we can, we can go, come to church, we can look at our lives, and we can say, well, I'm not needed anywhere. Everything is filled. I, I can't really do anything for Jesus. I can't really serve Jesus. Uh, but you can. And you just need to look for those, what you might perceive as insignificant things because they're not far away. They're, they are nearby. Our point is this. The extraordinary uh, comes out of the ordinary. Just like this extraordinary wine came out of the, this dirty old water, so too purpose and fulfillment, usefulness for Jesus is going to come out of the ordinary. You and I are like those water pots, by the way. Yeah? Don't think that, you know, I'm the new wine and so on. No. Well, in Jesus Christ, maybe you are. But in reality, we're, we're a lot like, the, like these water pots that they, they were used to cleanse people from the outside. But the water itself, you know, you got kind of dirty. But they didn't do anything for the inside. And Jesus, Jesus cleanses us from the inside out. The extraordinary comes out from the ordinary. And often that happens, doesn't it, where I want to serve Jesus, but I want to do the noticeable stuff because that's where it's at. I, I don't just want to be a candle. I want to be a, a, a beam of light where I'm seen. I don't want to do the background stuff. Let, let somebody else do that. But no, the extraordinary stuff, stuff comes out of the ordinary. 
And that's something we need to learn. A lot of times, the, the things that get in our way is, is the fact that we feel uh, we're, we're somehow uh, more entitled than our, the person that's sitting next to us. And that's why I say, you know, if, if you're going to be used by God, you need to put aside your pride because God resists the proud. He says no to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And, and that's a, a lesson that often is hard uh, for some of us. And I get it. There's discouragement when we're just busy filling the water, when we're not seeing the miracle, when, when we're just busy filling one cup at a time, filling this huge 20 to 30-gallon water pot, it seems like I'm just wasting my time here. I could be over here. I could be doing that. And we're, 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 what we're doing, actually, is we're, we're missing out on the trees before us, dreaming about the forest uh, ahead of us, dreaming about this, these, 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 these visions about, well, it's going to be great when I'm making the six figures, when, I, when I'm married or when I'm not married, you know? It, no, it's now. Don't miss out on what's before you because you're dreaming about something else, whether that something else is good uh, or not. You know, when the, the Israelites came back from, uh, from exile, 70 years in Babylon, they were allowed to rebuild the temple. The gloriousness of the temple was able to come back, right? And, but they needed to build stone upon stone. It took work. And the people were discouraged when they were in the work, uh, working uh, on it and on the foundation and all these things because they, the, they weren't doing the sacrifices yet and so on. And this is what Zechariah tells the people. In Zechariah 4.10, it says, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices for what? To see the work begin. Let me ask you this. Is the work, has the work begun in your life? Are you working for Jesus yet? If you're not, then I encourage you to start working for Jesus, to start serving the Lord wherever he has you. you know, don't look for far away stuff. Look for the nearby stuff, because the extraordinary comes out of the ordinary. Don't we see that in the life of Jesus? Think about it, guys. Jesus did not come on a throne. He didn't come to, to be born uh, uh, from a queen and a king. He, he was, the king of kings and the lord of lords was, came, and he was born in an inexperienced teenager's womb. Okay? And they were broke, too. He, he was on a, on a carpenter's salary, which wasn't much back then. There was no room for them in the inn. Jesus had to be born in a smelly uh, manger, right? And then here we see Jesus in our eyes when somebody is 30 years old and they're still not married, uh, they don't necessarily have, uh, they're still living with mom. We don't norm normally see that as uh, successful, right? We don't. And, and Jesus, by the eyes of the world, maybe, is like, there's nothing special about Jesus. They probably saw, saw him as underperformed. The Bible also tells us that it, he, he wasn't that good looking. It there was nothing in his exterior and his appearance that draw, drew people to him. So his glory was not found in, in these exterior things. It was found somewhere else, right? Again, Jesus is in this backwoods town in a low-budget wedding where they run out of wine, okay? But that is a place where his glory is going to be revealed. Do you get what I'm saying, where I'm going with this? You and I, we are, the, we are the, the, the insignificant things. And Jesus, if we humble ourselves, he can, he can do a great work through us. But we must humble ourselves. We must be faithful in the little things like these servants. Notice that these servants, they didn't say, when Jesus says, go fill the water pots, they didn't say, well, uh, let, let's, let's huddle up, let's, uh, let's have a Bible study, and let's see what, what it would look like if, if these water pots were full. No, right? They didn't say, well, let's study the Greek, and, uh, and, and let's see what Jesus really means. Maybe, maybe we need to search, or check it out in Aramaic first. Maybe he's being metaphorical. Maybe I'll just hang out here till we find the truth. No. What do they do? They started to serve Jesus. They started to do what Jesus said, and that's where they found uh, fulfillment. Maybe that's where you're at to that. I know it's speaking to somebody's heart uh, today. But there also needed to be faith, right? You don't just do work, but you also have faith in the work. And that's the difference between us and maybe religious people that are just doing works uh, for their own righteousness. No, we got to have faith. I say faith because you got this, uh, I don't know who the last guy was, the last servant, the guy in charge of having to take that picture to the, you know, the, uh, the banquet master, the headmaster. But that, that guy's job was on the line. Okay, he took that. He, he was taking. Well, I believe it was water when he took it to him, but somewhere along the way, it turned into wine. His job was in the line. He needed faith to to trust that when this guy, his boss, drank the water or the wine, it, it, you know, it, he wouldn't get fired. And likewise, in, in our service to Jesus, we need to understand that as well. You know, it's going to take some faith. I'm not saying you're not going to get fired, 
when you are faithful to be a witness at your workplace. If it happens, you just need to trust that, hey, I serve Jesus. Jesus is my employer before anybody else, and he's going to have something lined up for me elsewhere, even if I am persecuted by the world. The extraordinary comes out of the ordinary, the, the little things, the small things. Lastly, I want to focus on this last observation. Remember I mentioned that, uh, I mentioned that these water pots were uh, cleansing, purification pots. These water pots point, pointed to the law of Moses. They pointed to the rituals and whatnot, the exterior cleansing. But what Jesus does here is he changes the inside and he makes it something living. Some, uh, he makes it a, a newness, right? And this points to the new covenant. When, when the wine master told the groom, he's like, I know what you did here. You left the good wine for the last. When he did that, he didn't know that, that Jesus had done this at the time. I don't believe it. I don't believe he, he knew Jesus was the one that done it at that time. But what God does is just that. The world is going to offer you the best at first to conceal the, you know, the reality of things. The world is like that. It's a big lie sometimes. Oh, here, take this. It's like uh, getting somebody hooked on drugs. Oh, they'll, they'll give you drugs for free, and once you get hooked, it's, now you've got to pay. And once you're hooked, once you're, once you're addicted, now you've got to pay for it. And a lot of times, you know, you've seen pictures of people that have been hooked on meth and so on, and then they look like they aged 34 years and 10 years. And, and life is like that. And sometimes people will say, you know, uh, this is hell. Earth, it, you know, my life here, this is, this is hell. It, it ain't going to get any worse. Than this, but for unbelievers, it is. There is such a thing as a lake of fire. There's a, there's hell, but the Bible says in the future hell is going to be dumped out into the lake of fire. So it's bad now. It's going to get worse. Okay, for unbelievers, it's going to be like that without Jesus Christ. But Jesus came to bring the new. He came to bring life. So for the believer, the best is yet to come. No matter how good you have it now, it's going to be better with Jesus. No matter how bad you have it now, it's going to be greater with Jesus Christ in heaven. God reserves the best for last. The best. Is yet to come, like Greg Laurie says, right? God reserves the best for last. That's God's deal, right? God does it in that manner. So this religious pottery with water, that speaks of the old covenant. The new wine speaks of, speaks of the new covenant. That's a bigger lesson here that, that the Lord would want us to learn. The new covenant. That's what the hour uh, of Jesus Christ was about. You know, another observation to finish up here. When Jesus um, had the Last Supper with his disciples... He had communion afterwards. First came the, uh, the eating of the lamb, the Passover lamb, and then he had communion. The Passover lamb speaks about the exodus, it speaks about deliverance and so on. It speaks about the, the law and the old covenant. But the, the, the wine and the bread speaks about Jesus' body and blood. So they ate the old covenant, if you will, and they washed it down with the new. And that's the same, that's the, the, the line of thinking I want you to understand here. The idea, the, the big picture is like, yeah, we got the old, but the Bible says that the new and the better covenant is here through Jesus Christ. It was ratified through his blood. That is the simplicity of the gospel. Jesus came to bring grace and truth. No longer religion, no longer uh, uh, yet, you know, do's and don'ts, right? But, but yes, in Christ Jesus. He has a new covenant. He has new life in us. God reserves uh, the best last. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, right? To, to fulfill them. That's what it's about. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He comes to fulfill the law, just like these water pots were being uh, full. So my question to you is, do you have that life? Do you have that newness of life? I want to give you that opportunity this morning, if that's you, to give your life to Jesus Christ. Don't leave this place uh, without making sure that you know you are born again. And the Bible, the Bible keeps it simple. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth, that's a prayer, guys. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So it's confessing with your mouth. It's a prayer, but it's believing in your heart. If you're just saying a prayer, you're just being religious. But if you're believing with your heart, that's what God is about. He wants you to truly believe in him. And once you do that, you can be born again. So I encourage you to do that. Can I have the elders come up to the front, uh, please? And, and the worship team closes out. And if you'd like to do that, if you'd like to be born again, if you'd like to have a clean slate, if you'd like your sins to be forgiven, past, present, and future, I encourage you to do that, to not be, 
Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be in, uh, in fear of your neighbor. Also, if you need prayer for healing, prayer for anything really, come up here and we'll pray for you as well. We'll be here during the last song and also afterwards as well. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, we know it does not come back void. We ask that you do uh, what you want to do in our hearts, that we would leave this place uh, with uh, being fuller, being a brimming, Lord, uh, with you, with more of you and less of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.